This afternoon's sermon may be a bit different than normal because I want to talk about congregational singing. Most of the time we're going to the New Testament for the authority of Jesus Christ regarding our worshiping Him in spirit and in truth in order to show that singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5.19, is the only kind of music that God accepts any other kind is sinful because there's no authority for it. And while that is true, one of the things that we need to realize once we are established in doing all things by the authority of the Lord, singing being the kind of music the New Testament authorizes and I worship to God, is that we need to make sure that we are in the act of worship that is singing doing exactly as the Bible teaches. Now, as we go through this study, I certainly don't want anyone to think that uh, you're being unduly criticized. I warned uh, jokingly uh, a couple of song leaders say that they're going to really get worked over this afternoon, but that's only a joke. It's not meant to be that way. And the same is true when it comes to each one of you when you're sincerely and from the heart engaged in worshiping God in song. But I found it interesting that in a web blog back in 2006, a denominationalist by the name of Ray Pritchard asked this question, whatever happened to congregational singing? Now you would realize, not coming from strictly New Testament teaching, he would have views and so forth that someone properly schooled in the right division of the word on the matter of worshiping God in music and that it would be singing would not have and yet with the departures from the divine pattern in worship and in many other ways for the church then there are some things that he noticed that do fit <coughs> as far as the church is concerned and its departure from what the divine pattern says he mentioned that in visiting many denominational churches he often found the practice that is congregational singing to be lacking all together and here's what he said, and I'm quoting. I'm talking about singing that engages the whole congregation and unites the hearts of all present in sincere worship of the Lord. Now remember, when you talk about singing as an act of worship in the worship assembly, then you've got to realize the disposition of heart, not only that the Bible teaches we should have, not only applies to singing, but for every act of worship, the Lord's Supper, our prayers, and so on. In some churches that engaged in congregational singing, he said that he found the singing lackluster. Now, I realize that's a term that you'd have to have him specifically identify as what he meant by it, but I think we understand that it means one's heart's not right in it. They are just sort of saying the words. So then he went ahead to say, that is, give some reasons why that the singing, as he called it, was lackluster. He says, song leader chooses songs no one knows. Then he talks about style issues confusing people as to the different kinds of songs, the way they're written. He even talks about the architecture not always conducive to singing, and that's been a problem that a lot of us notice over the years in different church buildings, that sometimes the way it's built just sort of dumbs down the singing as far as the sound. He then said, not enough people. By that he meant, and he gave this, seven in a building that seats 500. Too many new songs presented too fast. And uh, one reason I said this to a couple of the song leaders who had a chance, one of the things that he said was, wooden worship leader. <laughs> now, again, I don't know what he means by wooden. Uh, again, it must be that there's no real leading. And I, I want to stop here and talk about that for a minute. We have somebody up here leading prayer. That person is a leader. Out there, we're followers. That's the reason that we need to know what the Bible teaches regarding scriptural prayer to God. The same thing is true when it comes to the observance properly, worshiping God in spirit and in truth regarding the Lord's Supper. There must be then proper training. We are what we are taught. 
And we're to do the Lord's will. The Lord's will is found only in the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, the New Testament. So if we're going to learn anything about anything spiritually, it must come from the written word of God. He then, of course, said this, which would be particularly so, that wouldn't necessarily bear upon the Lord's people, that musical instruments are so loud that the singing is overpowered. Then he said, songs with a little sense of order or progression of, or theme. Some congregations seem not to expect members to sing. And he referred to choirs. He talked about orchestras to do the singing for them all put together, which we would expect from people that really don't know how to write and divide the word of truth and not respectful to the authority of God's word. And as I said in the beginning, the kind of music God authorizes, which is singing. But then he said something, lack of spiritual zeal. You ever notice how much the Bible talks about in what we do as Christians and obedience to God that we should be zealous? There should be a zeal. There should be a putting of ourselves into it. There should be in every act and everything we do, there should be that zeal to do it because it is God's will. There should be in our worship then the zeal to practice and engage in the acts of worship as prescribed by the New Testament as our heart is in it. And we enjoy coming together to do that. That's what God wants to see in us. So you can see how some of these apply to denominational churches. Might not apply to us. Others would apply to, to us. Then he pointed this out. Preachers and other leaders don't sing. Well, I would carry that a little further. I would say there are times when different ones in the congregation that should be, ought to be, and that their scriptural will be singing, but they don't. I don't know what that is, but every congregation I've ever been connected with from my growing up days to now, there's now and then some people just sit there. I don't know where their minds are, but their voice is not engaged in doing what God told them to do in the case of singing. Then he emphasizes this, and this does impact the church, especially among those churches that really do not strive to do only as the authority of the New Testament directs them. The entertainment culture calls those in the assembly to expect to be entertained. Well, in a sense, entertainment's not bad because when we worship God, we are entertaining Him. In that sense, we want Him to hear us. We want Him to know whether it's a prayer or whatever the act of worship is, that we are directing all of that toward Him to show our devotion to Him, our love of Him, our desire to be before Him, lauding Him. Think of the songs well presented and sung a moment ago. And the song uh, service was very fine. I've stood here in this pulpit over the years and said that for the size audience we have and the people, we do some fine singing. But there needs to be even more said about the development of singing, the teaching of singing. And we've tried to do some of that. The last point he made was we have lost, he said, his words, the theological truth that God is to be praised in the singing of this people. I wouldn't have said theological truth. Theology means the study of God. Only from the standpoint of the Bible reveals God. I would say we haven't uh, looked at the Bible and realized the joy that God wants us to have in an assembly of worship. That each one of us joins in. Each one of us must worship. Each one of us benefits the other as we all direct our worship to God, whether it's prayer, whether it is uh, observance of the Lord's Supper, whether it's the study of the Bible, etc. Now in the Lord's Church, congregational singing and the worship of God is done because it's the only, let me underscore the word only, the only music the New Testament authorizes that purpose. Now if you were to say, well, why isn't the other all right? Well, this is not a sermon to deal with all of that, but I'll say simply, the New Testament mentions only singing when it comes to proper worship of God by Christians. New Testament Christians, and I use that terminology to separate us, and I deliberately want to separate us from those human churches that are denominations built upon and sustained by the commandments and doctrines of men. New Testament Christians, I say, have and do oppose the worship of God with mechanical instruments of music, choirs, special groups, quartets, solos, 
or sounds made with the human voice to mimic a mechanical instrument, or whistling, or a mouth that with the mouth uh, doing anything contrary to what the Bible said, which is singing. We want to please God. How can I know how to please God? Do what He said and the way He said it for the reason, or if there's more than one reason that He said it. It's that simple. We're interested in obedience as a manifestation of our faith in God, which faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. We want to walk by faith and not by sight in the assembly when we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth, the right attitude and disposition, directing our worship to God as His truth leads, guides, and directs us, John 17, 17. But we must be concerned about our singing in the worship assemblies of the church, even as you should be concerned about the preaching of the Word of God, the observance of the Lord's Supper, prayer, and so forth. These things don't just happen. To show you how, which is just to remind you because most know, to show you how that we benefit from those who do lead in worship, most of the men that I know of that are Christians have learned much about praying to God by listening to those they heard as they grew up. The words they choose and so forth. That's why a leader in the true sense of the word leader is so important. That's true of whatever said here at the Lord's table. The prayer is offered before the bread and the fruit of the vine. God has something to say about those prayers. We are leading everybody out there in the audience every time we do that. Where are we leading them? The same is true of singing. So we must not permit our singing to become half-hearted, and that's really where this is going. What is my responsibility to keep our singing like the New Testament teaches, that it is singing? The psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs ordained for us to sing, and then putting our heart into it. Just as a general observation, if you will think about the meaning of the word you're singing, it will go a long way toward helping these things out I've already mentioned. In fact, I don't know how you would worship God in truth when it comes to singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs if you didn't think about the words. Words have meaning. The words of the songs have meaning. Ephesians 5.19 says we're teaching one another as you direct this song our songs, to God. So I hope this sermon will help ensure congregational singing, will help encourage each one of us, because it's each one of us that makes the whole of the singing, that we might be what we ought to be, and that it will be, that is, the singing of the congregation will be in a proper place when it comes to our worship, just like the Lord's Supper, or our prayers, or whatever else we do, in word or in deed, by the authority of the Lord, Colossians 3.17. Now let me look first of all at the basis for congregational singing. There's a biblical precept for it. One of the things that's interesting that we may not know that many times is when you go back, and we can't spend a lot of time on it, but when you're reading your Old Testament, you do read your Old Testament, don't you? When you're reading your Old Testament, notice in the prophecies of the coming Christian age, the age of the church. How much is said about rejoicing? About singing connected to manifest that joy in rejoicing? Listen to this passage of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 12, 1 through 6. Now, Isaiah is the Messianic prophet. He lived about 750 years before Jesus walked this earth. So he's talking a lot about Jesus and reading these verses. And in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, thou, though thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and be not afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Declare the doings among the people. 
make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thy inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Now that was Isaiah saying, here is how it's going to be when the Messiah comes. Because he's going to save you. He's going to take away all your sins. Now, I suggest you go over, we won't now, but read Isaiah chapter 53 of God's suffering servant. And thus there's much to be sung and the zeal begins to take form in our lives. It's from the heart we engage in the singing of these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that's been ordained by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament for us as Christians to sing. We've already mentioned several times a couple of passages. We are commanded of God. It's not a choice, folks. We're commanded of God. You know, we look at the plan of salvation and we get to repentance and we quote or refer to Acts 17, 30, where God says He now commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, singing in the worship of God is a command also. And you're not going to be pleasing to Him if you decide you're not going to do it. You don't have that right to do that. If you're of the attitude that a child of God ought to have and all that child of God means and all that Christian means, one who is of Christ, you want to sing. You desire to obey Him. You want to give the best you have in the area of singing to Him. And I want to mark that point. I want to give the best I have. That may not be as much as somebody else, but it's the best I have. And the whole Old Testament system of sacrifices says you give the best as the Word of God directs you of what you have in sacrifice to God. And so you can use your voice to sacrifice to God. That is the voice. Now notice, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody where? In your heart. Directed to whom? To the Lord. Ephesians 5.19. As I say, we'll go to these passages and say to our religious friends round about us who use mechanical instruments of music or some other kind of music other than singing or with their singing. And we'll say, can't you see that verse says sing? And we'll go to every other verse in the New Testament that has to do with music in worship to God, and we'll say, can't you see that it says sing as the kind of music God wants? Well, there's a lot more in those passages than that. That's a lot. But you see what else is there. We're speaking to ourselves. Now, if you don't sing, you're not obeying God in that. Speaking to yourselves. It also rules out one person speaking to everybody in the worship assembly or a group of people singing to everybody while most of the church sits there and listens. That's not authorized by your New Testament. There's not a direct statement. There's not an implication. There's not an example of that happening as Christians assemble to worship God. Now notice what Paul said to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's where some of the zeal comes from. When the Word of God, the will of God is working in you by your knowledge of it and desire to carry it out, then what happens? Well, notice that it's richly in all wisdom. What re what's the result of it? Teaching and admonishing one another, how do you do it? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Notice, singing with grace or favor in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3.16. So you see, not only is just singing and singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but notice the disposition or attitude of the inward man as you come together for a given purpose. You could take that same, as I said earlier, disposition of heart in an assembly convened for religious purposes, in this case worship, and you can apply it to the observance of the Lord's Supper. Where's your mind when you're partaking of the bread? Where's your mind when you're partaking of the Lord's Supper? The observance of the whole Lord's Supper, done in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Showing forth, Paul said, his death till he come again. Well, what about engaging in these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? As we think of the meaning of the words, think of what we just sung, the songs we sung. I suggest sometimes that you sit at home and open your song book and read those songs. 
You might even also determine that there's some words in there you may not know. Well, you can't very well worship in song if it involves communication and understanding. If you're seeing something, you know what it means, or you're hearing something, you know what the person by you means when he says it. So it won't hurt anything to offer the best you have in the worship by spending some time outside of the worship assembly with the songs and reading them and understanding them. Clearly, we are then to praise God and we're to sing to God and speak to one another, teaching one another as we engage in that singing. There's a biblical principle that we need to look at. And that is one purpose of singing, as I've said, is to praise the Lord. By the way, that's inherent in the very meaning of the word hymn. That's what a hymn is. It's singing praise to the Lord. We are, I'm emphasizing here, to teach one another. And we're to teach one another as we sing these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Another point is to be enriched by the word, as I read a while ago in Colossians 3.16, and filled with the truth of that word. We're, we're on a spiritual plane. What does it mean to be on a spiritual plane? It's of the mind. You know, the whole New Testament system focuses on the inward man. It focuses more on the heart or on the spirit, on the mind. While the Old Testament certainly involved that, that is, under the law of Moses in particular, it's centered on so many carnal things. Now, by carnal, I don't mean fornication or something like that. Carnal covers far more than that. Carnal things means things of this world. And so much of the worship under the law of Moses for the Jews involved all sorts of pans and washings and clothes and this and that and the other. That's the point made when Jesus is dealing with the woman at the well in Samaria. When he talks about God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The New Testament elevates man, even in his worship, to be more on the spiritual plane. So when you're worshiping God, we go back to the Lord's Supper, it pertains to where your mind is. Uh, the bread and the emblem of the bread, representing the very body of Christ that knew no sin offered on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And the blood shed, the fruit of the vine represents it. Very simple, emblematic thing. But to those who know their book, then they know what it represents and the significance of the blood of Christ and our salvation. The blood of Christ had to be applied to us. Well, when it moves over then to that act of worship which is singing, then think of the words of the song. Think of the involvement that is there. Now, we'll say more about this later, but this is where even the leaders can help. And you know, you're sitting there with your children. You can help them to sing. It thrills my heart to hear some of these little ones that can hardly talk, but they've been around this all along. And you can just hear the little voices singing, not a word coming out, but they're trying. They're trying. You know, that's the way we all learn to talk. You ever notice that? We all learn to talk by saying nothing. <laughs> and they're trying. Do you think the Lord receives that? Well, I believe he does. They're doing what they can. They're innocent. They're sinless. They're pure. They're following your leadership as they learn. And what a wonderful thing that is. Take them out of the assembly. What do they learn anything but to be taken out of the assembly? <laughs> you won't do that. You need, they need to be in the worship assembly, learning by the experiencing of things done by the older people who know. And, of course, you can't take away the great importance of being taught these things at home. So congregational singing, singing reaches upward. Uh, it reaches outward. It certainly reaches inward as we direct all our praise to God as we speak to one another these messages that teach us, admonish us, and guide us. So proper congregational singing praises God always. But in doing so, it teaches one another. It uplifts ourselves. And thus, it helps reach that goal. Now, here are some suggestions. I underscore the word suggestions. More could be offered, but these, I think, are helpful. What song leaders can do. Now, let's just talk about song leaders. Some people that go under the name song leaders are really 
song starters and song enders. Because it takes something to be able to know how to lead a congregation. Now, I'll get on a congregation in a minute. <laughs> I mean that kindly when I say I'll get on a congregation in a minute. But having started out my career not preaching, if you want to put it career, but song leading, have you ever, I've got a picture at home of the only colt we ever raised. And when we were trying to halter break him, he just, you couldn't lead him. He would just put all four feet. You could pull him all you wanted to. But trying to get him used to it, we just tied him to a tree. I've got a picture of him at home. And he said, all four feet pulling against that tree. Sometimes that's my brethren when the poor old song leader is trying to get them to get up to speed. I've seen some... <laughs> I've seen some song leaders about lose it because it's like trying to lead that colt. You just got to prize them loose. Well, that's even more so when you consider the songs that we sing. Now, there's been some comments, uh, right and good and wholesome, from uh, John West and from Gary Blassingame on Sunday afternoon when they do some teaching here about the time signature on a song. A song that is written in 6-8 time is not to be Sung three-quarter time. Now you say, what difference does it make if I'm singing and i got my mind on it? Well, what difference does it make if fellas going down the interstate out here driving 30 miles an hour when everybody else is going 70? Now you say, well, that has to do with worshiping God. It has to do with saving your life. It has to do with making a point and don't miss the point. When we sing four-part harmony, then when you sing with notes, and by the way, Somebody says, well, I, I, I sing without a key. No, 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 no. You, nobody, ever, nobody can sing. It's an absolute impossibility without singing with a key. Maybe a wrong key, but you're going to sing. Ooh, you're going to sing one place there. And so, so I'm saying simply, if we're offering the best we can in the nature or in view of what I've just been talking about from God's Word, then doesn't it say we should work on those things? Doesn't it say that we do it outside the assembly? Doesn't it say that we are doing it to please our God and to do the best we can to set an example to those around about us and to do the teaching that's right with them? No, not all of us are going to be better at the actual singing uh, than somebody else or somebody's not going to be as good as somebody else. That is not the point at all. Song leaders then need to be mindful when they get before a congregation. There's just all sorts out there, even in a smaller congregation, this one is. But they need to lead with enthusiasm. Reach out there and get them and bring them in. So there's a matter of, of leading. There's a matter of starting and stopping. And we, and I'll mention this a minute as a congregation, need to be mindful of what the song leader's going through up here. Trying to announce, trying to plan, trying to think of the songs, the nature of the songs, what the songs say, and plan it out. And we ought to be cooperative in that way that we can sing with enthusiasm. Because the leader usually sets the the, the tone and about anything he does, and I use tone there not necessarily when it comes to singing, but in anything in the nature of leadership, whether it's a coach, basketball, or football, or whatever it might be, makes a big difference. And the song leader's influence goes beyond announcing the number and starting the song. Uh, the song leader's demeanor should reflect the nature of the song he leads. He is, he is expediting the worship of God in song. The expedients come because we have an obligation. The obligation is to worship. To worship in this case in singing. And the one who leads is there because things are to be done decently and in order. So those things need to be kept in mind. When you're, There's more, in other words, to it than knowing the notes, knowing the key of the song, and all this kind of thing. We should uh, help each other in this. 
We need to be careful about singing the same songs repeatedly. Years and years ago, when I was leading singing a whole lot, and that goes back a long time ago, a long, long time ago, what I did every week, because I was leading singing every week, was simply to take a list. Here's what I sang today. I dated it. If I was singing both Sunday morning and Sunday night, I put a.m. and p.m. So when the next week comes along, you know what happens to a lot of song leaders? They sit down and they start going through that book. They can't remember what they sang last time. Especially as a few weeks go by. And you know what's easy to do? You sing the same songs over and over again. But if you'll write it down, yeah, that's expediency too. That's decent in order also. That helps you be what you ought to be to them as you're leading. You write those down and you keep in a file. And you can go back and say, well, here's the last time I sang this song. Same thing's true of invitations. Now, where we have, as we do here, several men leading singing, and then they're going to pay attention to what the other song leaders are leading. Now, the world won't fall apart. And you won't necessarily lose your soul in hell if you happen to sing a song at night or in the afternoon that was sung this morning. But we're talking about decently in order. We're talking about expediting an obligation, in this case, sing. We're talking about the place the song leader has to be in it and uh, so forth. Some songs are regularly sung. We don't watch out. While others are rarely sung and sometimes not sung at all. Song leaders can keep a list. So let me emphasize that and leave that point because that all has to do with helping you in the songs that you are going to lead. Lead with familiarity. And let me say this about that concerning those who first start to lead singing. Don't try to pick a song that has all sorts and sizes of parts in it that would take a professional quartet to sing and get up there and start to sing when you may have never done much of it at all. Start with something like on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Start with those songs like that. You're new, you're unfamiliar, uh, you're here to worship God with all the rest. You want to lead the church to worship God. Do it when everybody can feel comfortable in the songs. People respond to songs they know and they love. People are able to catch on and sing songs that are new to them. But we usually find a problem here. For some reason, members of the church don't think they can come together to learn a song. And thus, when we learn them, it tends to be in the actual worship assembly. Well, let me encourage you by this. We all have to learn to sing together in the worship. That's true, and I'm not saying you can't learn a song in the assembly. But after all, it's not a place of learning. It's a place of extolling God with the best you've got. Now, you know, back when I was in the band in high school, the director would pick the songs by trial and error that he knew we, as a band, could play. Then once we had uh, proven we could play in that high school band these certain songs, then they would be, especially in concert season, the songs that we would dwell on. And we would practice those songs till they ran out of our ears. Then when we put on a performance, guess what? We did the best we could with all we had out of practice. For some reason, the worship of God Almighty, God's children, just kind of balk at that. I learn it, I'm going to learn it here, and don't expect me to come any other time. What we've forgotten is that many, many years ago, singing schools were all over the place in the brotherhood, where people came together all the time to learn the rudiments of music, to learn new songs, to practice. Now you say, well, I just don't know where I can do that. Preachers don't mind practicing. Brother Roy Deaver told me back when he was a young man, the late Roy Deaver, some know, some don't, said he preached a many a sermon in practice to a herd of cows. 
Well, when I first started, I preached to a mirror. Or else I would go over to the church building when nobody was there and hope they wouldn't come in. And I'd lower the boom on those, entry, uh, those empty benches. You practice. And you say, well, I've never thought about that when it comes to preaching God's Word. Well, don't you want somebody that's able to halfway present the lesson in a systematic form, right dividing the word proof, so if the people take heed what they hear and how they hear, they'll learn something? If you can do it when it comes to preaching, then you can do it in songs that do teach and admonishing one another in those songs. We used to have classes that were called training to serve. Do you think we could get very many people together at all today outside of the time we're here to come to a special time to learn how to sing or to learn how to do whatever? We just take it for granted. It won't work that way, not as it ought, to give our best to God. So too many new songs in the worship can handicap the worship. And all you have to do is just remember some time that's done. Yet, if some new songs are going to be learned because people won't come together and learn them in a class, that's about the only time it can be done. So this presents a dilemma to the song leader, for he knows that few members will learn a song except it's sung during the worship symphony. Poor song leader. Song leaders need not be accomplished, but they should be thoughtful of their function as an expedient. Sometimes in gospel meetings when I am preaching on the kind of music that pleases God in worship, because I'm emphasizing how the Bible authorizes, I'll ask the song leader, are you authorized? Does the New Testament authorize you? Well, most of them don't know how to answer that. Of course you're authorized, because we're to do all things decently in order. Uh, song leader is an expedient. It expedites. It's an advantage to having him. But it seems like sometimes there's a war between the congregation and the song leaders of who's going to lead who. The practice of congregational singing is the way God wants it. He doesn't want it any other way. And we've got to recognize that we're the only ones that can put it into practice. We are to teach and admonish one another. That means we've got to speak up. You can't sit there and admonish your neighbor when you sing, oh, praise you, oh, God, oh, I'm sure you'd like to hear me preach this way. Well, you're teaching, aren't you? How can you teach anybody when you don't speak up where they can hear the words that you're singing? Maybe we think so. Well, I don't sound good when I sing. <laughs> I think God thinks you do if you're singing from the heart and keeping his will. Besides that, you can get better at it. Notice Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Practice may not make perfect, but it'll make you better. Sing with others whenever there's the opportunity. This is speaking, of course, now from the song leader of the church. There's a time and place to learn new songs. We ought to try to do it at a time and place outside the worship because in the worship the practicing should have already been done and the best we can offer is being offered few members sing anywhere but in the worship and that's a shame if you read James he says if anybody's happy sing I don't know why we don't sing anymore you say well I don't like to sing well how can you get better at it and here to offer this to God if you don't learn. Sit close to those who love to sing. They'll help you out. Well, at home, you can also sing, and we have some CDs like this, with the people who sing them very well. So you can be better. Yeah, but I don't... Do you want to offer God the best you have as a child of God in the worship assembly where you've commanded to worship God that way? Or do you want Him to say... Well, he's just doing the best he can with what he's got right now, but he could do better if he had tried during the week. Now, let me mention in getting close to the end, a four-part harmony. And some people sing soprano, tenor, alto, bass, baritone, and a great many people sometimes sing also. 
And some people seem flat. Some people seem sharp. You can learn about those things. Because you want to make the whole worship of God be an example to everybody else that's there. There may be non-members here. But it takes learning. We always preach, you, we, you can't accomplish the study of the Bible like God wants you to if all the study of the Bible is in a sermon like this or a Bible class. You have to be doing it at home where you also display your love of God. And the same is true of singing. You become familiar with these songs. And you need to know the songs well enough to know whether you're singing error or not. We're to offer hymns of praise to God. The Bible says, as I read a moment ago, Hebrews 13, 15, these are spiritual sacrifices. Teaching and admonishing one another in song is one way we exhort one another, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. In fact, we can quote Hebrews 10, 25, but sometimes Hebrews 10, 24 we miss. And yet there he's talking about provoking one another into love and good works. Do you think our singing could do that? Aren't many songs designed to provoke us to closer walk with God and to be more faithful? Well, these are some things that can help our singing from the song leader to each one of us as participants. And understanding on our part that these are acts of worship, but they're sacrifices of praise. And we ought to be involved in them just as much as what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper about the Bible when it's read, about the sermon when it's preached, and so on. So I hope this is not going to be taken. I haven't preached a sermon like this since I've been here. That's a while. That's my fault. But we need to preach it. We need to hear it, and we need to go and think about it. Do not take it for granted. That's a big problem. And you see what is getting us in this nation as a nation. What about in the body of Christ? the kingdom of Christ. And each member in particular, what are you doing about these things to make the worship more well-pleasing to God in a fervent spirit and desire to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. If you're not a child of God, of course, you must abide by the will of God and do what He says in order to become a Christian, to believe with all of your heart Christ the Son of God Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Then and then only will you become a Christian. The Lord will add you to His church. And in that church, you serve Him faithfully, and that involves worshiping Him according to His will. The child of God, if you've wondered, if you left the truth, if there's sin in your life, we urge you to repent. We urge you to pray God for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. God will hear and forgive. Please take this message as it's meant to edify and make us better in our service to God and especially in our worship assemblies when it comes to singing. If you're subject for the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.